Welcome to God of Women. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest today is Kyle Macy Hall. He runs for the Van Cortlandt Track Club. Indeed, I met Kyle over the Memorial Day weekend when he and his teammates participated in the relay 500 for the Fallen. The relay is sponsored by Run Anyway Foundation. It's their signature event. Kyle and his teammates paid their respects at the Memorial Grove, which was the staging area located in Van Cortlandt Park. They took off to meet me and my team at Columbus Circle in New York City. Along the route, Kyle took some stunning photos that he used to highlight his post on his blog. I'm thrilled to have Kyle as a guest. Thanks a lot, Will, for having me. It's a pleasure. Before we go into the, that relay that I met you, let's introduce you to our audience. I was born in 29 Palms, California, Air Ground Combat Center. It's, uh, the Marines call it the Stumps. It's in the middle of the Mojave Desert in California. So I was a Marine brat growing up. My family moved all over. But my family has its roots in Kentucky. That's where both my parents are from and where they met and got married. So that's where it all started. That's also where I started uh, training for cross country in high school, and I'm still running 23 years later. Interesting. Let's go back. I saw your little bio when I saw where you were born. 29 Palms, I had to look that up. And then I realized that that's a very well-known area in the sense that it's been presented on television and movies. Yeah. Independence Day on 4th of July, the movie, they had pilots coming from the 29 Palms. <laughs> I didn't realize that, but I know Robert Plant had a song about 29 Palms. Uh, U2's album, Joshua Tree, the Joshua Tree is the only place where they grow is in um, uh, the Joshua Tree National Park, which is located right there in 29 Palms, in the town of 29 Palms, which is right outside the base where I was born. <laughs> and your dad was a Marine, is that? And your mom was a housewife? She was. Um, well, my dad was a Marine Corps officer, uh, major, um, and he was an artillery officer at 29 Palms. And my mom was a housewife for many years, then she ended up becoming a nanny. Um, she worked in the school system for a while, and she worked at a, a hotel for a while. Now she's helping raise uh, grandchildren. So. Okay, well, let's go back into Kentucky. So I guess that's where you went to school? That's where I graduated high school. I started school in Florida. And that's where my dad was stationed. He was the only Marine at Patrick Air Force Base in Satellite Beach, Florida. Okay. The only Marine station there. So uh, I started high school there in ninth grade, and then I finished 10th, 11th, and 12th at Seneca High School in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh -huh. Most people, I guess, in the north would say Louisville. Down there, people with their accents, they say Louisville. Oh, really? Louisville, Kentucky. Well, how do you say now? <laughs> Louisville. I say Louisville, <laughs> but I have to moderate some. Usually I say it both when I'm in New York. I say Louisville, Louisville, and then people are like, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, now I know what you're talking yeah, about. Louisville to go, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. I actually ran my first race in Washington, D.C. when I was 10 years old. And then the year after that, I told my dad, I said, I want to run the 10K with you along the Potomac River in D.C. This is when we were uh, stationed uh, outside the Quantico Marine Corps Base in Virginia. And I said, I'd like to run that 10K with you. So I ran it with my dad when I was 11. And then when, by the time we got to Kentucky, I, started, I was ready to start training for cross country. So I'd done a little running, but my training started when I was 15 in 10th grade, Seneca High School. Uh -huh. And I started running with some of these folks. And then I ran at Wabash College in Indiana. And where, where is Wabash College? It's in Crawfordsville, Indiana. It's about 45 miles northwest of Indianapolis. Okay. Would you there on a running scholarship or anything like that? Maybe in a roundabout way. It's a Division three school. Okay. Oh, so okay. it's kind of academic, it? maybe in a way indirectly an athletic scholarship. Sometimes Division three schools, uh, that's how it works because they're not allowed to give out athletic scholarships. But I ran there under Coach Johnson. We had a great program. We, we went to the national championships in 98. Uh, and actually, right before I got there, um, the team had placed third and fourth in the NCAA Division Three Championships. That was when the Three Amigos were there. The Three Amigos I've written about on my website. Okay. Um, some stories about those guys, some famous runners, um, one of whom went, ended up running in the Olympic trials. Others and the, and the Three Amigos uh, ran um, in the World Mountain Running Championships. Just a great group of oh, runners. Oh, okay. So they were mentors of yours? or They were. I went out and some other Wabash guys, and I went out in summer of 98 and 99. We trained with them at altitude in Wyoming and then in Colorado the following summer. Oh, my gosh. So. It sounds like you've been all over the place. <laughs> Running has brought me great fortune, and not necessarily financially, 
<laughs> but in exp life experience. And... Okay, all right. <laughs> but I know you're a teacher at this point, so, so how, well, how did you make the transition into a school teacher? That happened actually, it was a revelation I had while running in Norfolk, Virginia on September 7th, 2001. It was actually the day um, we began bombing Afghanistan. Um, which was something I was vehemently against mm -hmm. when I was in graduate school. I was, at the time, I was at Harvard Divinity School, but I was an intern at the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, uh, PETA, in Norfolk, Virginia, uh -huh. and I was getting into animal rights activism. And I was on a run in Norfolk, and I thought I had this uh, vision of being a youth minister. And then I thought, okay, I'll become a youth minister, a youth pastor, just like my friend Lance is with Run Anyway. That's right. Interesting. <laughs> great guy. Great guy who introduced me to Will and got me involved with the 500 for the Fallen Relay. But what ended up happening is over several months, I shifted that focus into an education uh, ministry, uh -huh. which is, I guess, what I've been involved in for the last 11 years. Oh, okay. Um, so it wasn't a church ministry, but... But it's the ministry of... It's a calling. It was a calling. Yes, of course it is. So are you a graduate of Harvard? I am. I graduated from Harvard in 2004 with a Master of Divinity degree. Where did that love for animals and your fellow human being come from? I wrote about this in, in my memoir, which is forthcoming, but you can read some uh, segments of it on my website. I remember when I was seven and eight years old, it started with just a feeling for wanting to clean, clean the gutters in my neighborhood with, of trash. And I had I had strong feelings about litter, and I was I joined Cub Scouts and then Boy Scouts. I eventually became an Eagle Scout. This is back um, in uh, Kentucky. Yes, I became an Eagle Scout in Kentucky, but I went through Cub Scouts um, and starting in well, starting in Kentucky when yeah. I was in third grade, and then Virginia, uh -huh. and then Florida, uh -huh. and then eventually back to Kentucky to get my Eagle Scout award. Okay, um, so it started young for you, but for some reason you it was. Was in your DNA. It I mean, was this. It, it was, was just this feeling of in, uh, connection with the environment. Uh -huh. um, perhaps it's my family's Native American ancestry. Perhaps my, from my dad's side. Perhaps it's um, it's just this con uh, connection that was just intuitive for me. Okay. But eventually, when I read in college about destruction of the Amazon rainforest um, to produce uh, hamburger meat. Um, <laughs> in order to, you know, to graze all the, okay. the cattle, yeah. the amount of space the cattle need yeah. for grazing. It started with that, and then I later saw videos about animal abuse and torture, then I interned at PETA, and by that point I said, okay, vegetarian's not enough, I have to be vegan. And then I actually, I had thyroid cancer in 2002. What? And the vegan diet really helped get me through that, eating more plant-based foods, fruits, vegetables, and I've been in remission ever since. W did you need to take a, a chemotherapy or anything like that? I did, radiation therapy, because there was a malignant tumor in my thyroid, so okay. they took that out with two surgeries at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital. The vegan diet, which I got into at that time, really helped me and has kept me on the straight course, and I haven't had any problems since then, although I do have to take the daily medicine to, to compensate for the lack of a thyroid. Okay. How old were you when you had the uh, diagnosis? I was in grad school. I was about 24, 24. years old. Okay, okay. So, sounds like you were always a runner since 10 years old. What was your first school that you worked with? How did you, how did you get into the Bronx? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. I, uh, I did my student teaching at Lexington Public High School in Lexington, Massachusetts. Um, since I was in graduate school there in, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Lexington's about 15 miles outside Boston. So I started there, um, and then uh, I was there for one semester, and then I got my teaching license in Massachusetts by at the time that I was graduating in 04 with my Master of Divinity. Mm -hmm. And then soon after that, um, I, I was engaged at the time. To that, be married? Yes, sir. Okay. That never worked out, but <laughs> soon after. A year and a half later, I didn't realize, but I, I wasn't even with the woman anymore. But that brought me to Arizona, where I worked for a short time as a substitute teacher at Brophy College Preparatory School, uh -huh. which is a very elite prep school where Senator McCain and Senator Kyle, former Senator Kyle of Arizona, have sent their kids, a lot of the CEOs and other executives in, in, in the Phoenix area, send their sons there. It's an all male Jesuit preparatory school. Okay. I was a substitute teacher there. Uh, they basically told me at the end of the semester, it was a very insulated community, they basically told me, okay, um, your services are no longer needed. <laughs> Thank you and goodbye. Okay. But I said, what am I going to do? All right. The engagement was over at that point. Okay, my this is a turning point here. teaching career was over. It was a huge turning point as I teach my students now for the regents exams. Turning point. 
this was a turning point. <laughs> this was a major change. So I, uh, I saw in the newspaper, I'm a big newspaper reader, everyone in my family is, and I said, oh, New York City Public Schools recruiter is going to be here in Phoenix at some fancy resort in Phoenix, and they're going to have a recruitment fair, and you can bring your resume. So I just went there. I said, okay, you know, I'll just go and see what happens. And the woman hired me. They're really in need of more teachers here in New York. And I just accepted it on the spot. No call to my parents. No one else to really answer to at that point. I didn't have my cat yet, which I take care of now. So it was just me. And I said, okay. And then I said, well, where in New York? Of course, I'm thinking, oh, Manhattan, that would be exciting. Um, she says, well, where we really need people the most is uh, Queens and the Bronx. And I'm like, oh, I've heard of the Bronx. Okay, the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> and ever since then, now uh, for the last, uh, since 2005, I've been living in the Bronx and teaching in the Bronx. Okay. <laughs> and, you t and you, what's your subject matter? Uh, social studies. So oh, global, on the high school level? Yes, sir. All, always high school. Global U.S. government economics. Any social studies. Oh, excellent. All public schools, always in the Bronx. It's been a rough well, the ride. The Bronx is uh, it's a tough, could be a tough borough. So, so is your class... Um, Difficult kids do you have to get to through? It is. Uh, right now we have uh, over 85% of our students are English language learners, L's we call them. So great kids from all different countries, especially from Dominican Republic and Yemen and Bangladesh and Albania, many different places. Oh my gosh, yeah. Many countries in Africa. Yeah. So they come to us, their families having just immigrated here, and they need to learn English and they need to learn government and economics and all these other subjects and pass the regents and graduate all at once. And they don't have any of the advantages that American-born students do because since they just arrived. And it's a regents school, meaning the students need to pass a rigorous exam to get the regents scholarship. They I do. Mean, the regents diploma. They do, which is really unfair for the students who aren't Spanish speakers. Their exams are all translated. So they get a Spanish exam and an English exam. They get both booklets for all the regents. Our Arabic-speaking students, our Bengali-speaking students, and others, they just get the English booklet, even if they just arrived the year before. Yeah, All English. They get a translator there during the test, ah. an interpreter, but that interpreter is running around talking to the other oh, students of the same language. It's really, there's some uh, disparity there in terms of how the students are treated. There's only, I think, five different languages recognized by the state that, tr that get the translated exams. Oh, my goodness. So that that's is, a problem. That is, uh... Well, I, I, at least they're making the effort. You know, maybe uh, it's not the best, but uh, that is that is fascinating. Something that should I, be changed. You, well, yeah. with your background as an activist, I have a feeling uh, <laughs> that you're not shy about making your views known, <laughs> which well, is good. <laughs> I remember my first year teaching. We actually brought students up to Poughkeepsie. We actually did a home demonstration, similar to what I used to do in animal rights, outside of uh, an, an education official's home. Um, to protest for more funding for small schools. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's unfortunate that uh, many schools need to, to do that kind of uh, advocacy. Now, at some point, you made the discovery of the Van Cortlandt Track Club because you're now yes. a member of it. Well, I joined Van Cortlandt Track Club in, in 07. It's been a great experience. We're a great team. We meet at least three days a week. Some people go to every workout. Some go to one. Some people go to the races to get points for the team. Um, great experience. I've been with them a while. Um, I've run 10 marathons now, starting in 09, and I've written about some of that on my website, Don't Let My Parents Read This. .com. <laughs> why, why is it called <laughs> Don't Let My Parents Read This? Well, the, cha the cha uh, book title is Don't Let My Parents Read This. .com. That's going to be the memoir that's forthcoming in a year or two. Oh, okay. In the meantime, I wanted a platform to be able to get some of the chapters and excerpts out there to the public to be able to share whether people would like to read it or not. <laughs> I want it to be out there. I just feel compelled to put it out there. So I said, well, I want to stay consistent with the title. So, okay. so I made my website title the same as the book title, and then my Instagram also the same. So don't let my parents read this. It probably encourages them to read this. But I read a few things, and it's quite intriguing. I don't know if it's in the, in the blog, but in 1996, way before you were with the Van Cortlandt Track Club, you were part of the Olympic torch relay. How did yes. that happen? Oh, that was great. That was an amazing experience. Um, that was the same year Muhammad Ali um, lit the, the final torch in the cauldron there in Atlanta. And I was very blessed to be able to be holding that same torch with the same flame as it passed through southern Indiana. Assistant principal at my school 
had nominated me in a local nominating um, contest um, to try to be selected um, just for some work I'd done in my school. In particular, I was cleaning the trophy cases, the old trophy cases <laughs> at, at our school, Seneca. I'm actually wearing the ring from the school today. <laughs> oh, okay. But I, I, I don't know, for some reason, I'd taken upon myself to dust out the old and reorganize the trophy cases. We had many of them around the school, and they were just in total disarray. And I guess that touched him. He nominated me, and he spoke with my father about it, who was the head of the ROTC program at my school at the time. Oh, really? The Marine Corps ROTC program. Yeah, so yeah. they got together, and I actually was selected as an escort. I wasn't the official torch bearer, but one of the ladies I ran with, who, ha who was a torchbearer, Kirby Adams, she now writes for the Louisville Courier Journal paper, and she was a TV personality in, in Louisville before. Uh -huh. I ran with her, and she was very nice, and she let me carry the torch at one point. Otherwise, I would have just been running as an escort. As an escort. So uh, she let me carry the torch. It's not like crew, you're giving her water <laughs> in, case, in case she falters, you pick it up. Basically, <laughs> basically. Um, so I didn't have much of a role originally, but then I got to have my, my few minutes of fame there. I have it on video, and afterwards we got to go to this party, and I got to meet Jenny Simpson, who was a, a University of Kentucky um, All-American gymnast, and, and other people, who very interesting people who'd been in the relay. So yeah, it was yeah, a very yeah. exciting time, yeah. especially yeah. As, a, as a high school student. Yeah, yeah. I, I tried to get, uh, in 2000, it was 1996, 2004, we tried a similar thing to get our team and training coach, Ramon, into okay. it. We put, you know, the recommendations, the, the little um, blurb, and, you know, why why should Ramon do it? And he's a terrific guy. And we learned there's a lot of politics in picking the, uh, maybe it's different in Indiana, but in New York City, they pick people like Jennifer Lopez. From the Bronx? Yes. Yes, and we couldn't believe it because you know, he, uh, she wanted uh, her own hairstylist and she wanted special clothing mm. to do. Anyway, she got such, a, fe such, a, uh, such a feedback from that that uh, she cleaned up their act. <laughs> but we were pretty upset that our guy couldn't get picked, but Jennifer yeah. Lopez did. Congrats that you, you. you did get picked Thanks, because Will. it's a real honor. Thanks. And obviously something you will always treasure. Yes, definitely. All right, well, let's go back into Van Cortlandt Track Club. They're not the only track club around, so why did they pick you or you picked them? You know, why them? Well, we're a long-standing team. I have to admit, when I first found out about them after I'd only been living in New York maybe a year and a half, I just Googled um, New York running teams. Actually, I think Bronx specifically, because just because trying to find a Bronx team close to where I was living. And, I, and Van Cortland Track Club popped up, so I went out there one day. They happened to be doing a, a relay, um, which we just had in early July. And I jumped in on that. That was my first official event with the team. And then I said, this is great. You know, very friendly people, um, committed, dedicated runners, all different levels. So I started running races with them, got involved with a lot of New York Roadrunner races, team points, club points races. Well, that's how it starts. And then two years later, you ran your first marathon. Was that New York? Uh, yes. Two years after joining the team um, and getting a lot of information and advice from folks in Van Cortland Track Club, I ran the New York City Marathon in 09. Um, 258.19. Oh, first. nice. Up three. And yes. So at the time, I had no idea. I just said, I'm just going to run. That's a good thing. Your first one, there's no real pressure. Then after that, you are you feel like you're under pressure to try to better that every time. And now I've done 10 marathons. Okay. I think you, you did one in Boston that you're very proud of. Tell us about that. Uh, well, I've done Boston four times. And um, I've been proud to be there every time. It's a great race. It's my favorite marathon. Um, all the folks and all the towns we pass through, the small New England towns are just fantastic. I feel like they give more boisterous support than anywhere else. And the course is narrower in Boston compared to New York. It's narrow almost the whole way. So you're right with the crowd. And it's just an amazing experience every year, starting at Hopkinton and finishing on Boylston Street. But unfortunately, as folks know, in 2013, um, we had the tragedy there, and, and so uh, as Meb Klefleski, who won the U.S. Olympic trials this year in the marathon, has, has spoken about, um, I, I also like to run in, in honor of the folks who died there, mm -hmm. um, those folks who were murdered by the terrorists, and, and we were all touched um, tremendously by that. I happened to be in a hotel room two blocks away when it happened and heard the explosion and saw the smoke, and yeah. then I had survivor's guilt for a while after that, feeling like I was so close. Guilt. I was so close, but I wasn't hurt. It was actually all yeah. the spectators that were injured, the people who yeah. were supporting us, people yeah. who had been standing there just 
when I came by a couple hours before who were supporting me, those are the people who were injured and killed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't the, even the runners. So then I had this guilt and, and then guilt about whether I, I wish I'd been two blocks away to help. And it was just a horrible, yeah. horrible experience. You said to Boston four times. Was that your first? Or? Oh, for Boston, that ended up being my third Boston. Your third. I okay, sounds like more. you did it again the next year to honor I did it. the fallen. Yes, sir. I okay. did it again the next year. I had to come back that next year after that. Okay. And they actually gave each of us these, um, oh, these Boston bracelets, bracelets which okay. are actually made from the, the banners that had been hanging on the signposts the year before, 2013, that said Boston Marathon. And then they, they cut up the banners from 2013. Oh, as, okay. So when you collected your bib, they had that, that there as well? Yes, at the, the packet pickup. And they have Boston with the heart signifying what had happened the year before. So this is something special they gave us. Oh my the medal, gosh. of course, every Boston medal I have looks the same except for the year. But this one is especially important since it was 2013. 13. Oh, okay. In honor of all those who, who fell. Yeah, yeah. Survivor's so guilt. You were the first one that to mention that. I'm just trying to get a sense. Where does that come from? You know, is, is, is that a burden or is that a gift? You know, to be, to be that to have that kind of empathy. What do you think? Well, I feel strange even talking about it because I don't want to sound holier than thou or okay. morally superior. But I don't know. I guess it all goes back to the animal rights, the feeling that I need to, to help animals. You know, right, I need right. to save 100 lives a year by being vegan or yeah, I, need to, yeah. uh, I need to run, you know, because that's a gift. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and that I need to be thankful for, you know, overcoming cancer. But I still feel strange putting that I'm um, focusing on myself. But I guess, I guess it is a gift to feel empathetic towards others. Yeah, yeah. Human or non-human. I saw in your bio that you are a follower of Gandhi. Now, what, what does that mean? Is that in a religious sense, in a spiritual sense, in a wisdom sense? Well, I'm Christian from a religious standpoint, but I, uh, Gandhi's philosophy of ahimsa and nonviolence um, towards all living creatures. Mm -hmm. um, which is a Hindu, also a Jain philosophy from India. Um, that's just something that really struck me when I was in college and I was, I was reading um, first at Wabash and then at Harvard, reading about Gandhi and then becoming involved in activism, human rights, animal, mm -hmm. animal rights and environmental activism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, just this strict adherence to nonviolence and respect for, for God's creation. Um, that I guess when I say a follower of Gandhi, that's what I mean. Okay, um, his 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 life and his way of life struck you as the right way. Yes. Okay. Yes. I could keep it simple. That's part of it too. Yeah. Yes, living okay. simply, um, not being so obsessed with material goods. Okay, and that's and that's one of your goals is to simplify things as much as possible. It is. It is. And one reason why I had a flip phone up until um, late April. I now do <laughs> have an year? iPhone. Yes, sir. Okay. And why I was one of the last uh, Americans to even get a cell phone. At the time I moved to New York, my first two years in New York, I actually was still using a calling card and pay phones. I was probably the last person in New York City to be using pay phones. Interesting. I'm exaggerating somewhat, but <laughs> I think some folks still use them here and there. But I, I'm pretty sure I was one of the last people to get any kind of cell phone. And then I just graduated with a smartphone in April, which I'm very happy with. Um, that's mostly because of my website, the reason I got oh. it, <laughs> and to take photos. <laughs> uh, so you, you're still evolving here. All right. Excellent. I am. Excellent. What are some of your future challenges? First, uh, athletically, are, are you have anything coming up that, uh, that's going to challenge you? Well, I know this, this program won't be broadcast till afterwards, but on July 21st, I'm running a 5,000 meter track race in Tokyo. I'm going on an Asian expedition, which I will be documenting every day on my website, don'tletmyparentsreadthis.com, and on Instagram, don't let my parents read this. Okay. And I'm, that'll be a huge adventure in Thailand, one day in Shanghai, two and a half weeks in Japan, and a few days in, in South Korea, all the way up to the DMZ. Oh, that's occurring, I think, in a few days, right? Yes, sir. I'm leaving in uh, two days. And then I've got some races in Kentucky in late August when I go to visit my family. Okay. Louisville and then Bardstown, Kentucky, out in bourbon country. And then in the fall, I'm running the Philadelphia Marathon and a bunch of team points races with, with Van Cortland Track Club. Sounds like you got a full schedule. 
Yes, sir. Mm. These things get planned out pretty far okay. in advance. Okay, you say you were engaged once. Is, is, uh, is your romantic life uh, back in action? <laughs> I've been dating a very nice, special woman as of late. She actually lives here in Manhattan. Oh, okay. But I'm single. Okay. And I uh, haven't been in a relationship for six months now. Oh, uh, okay, good. But you still have, you have, you have a special lady, you said. Uh, yes. Oh, okay. um, just not an official relationship. Oh, okay, all but right. Someone, well, uh, well, activity well, partner, I guess. Uh, okay, so... We will check your Facebook page and see well, when did that gets upgraded. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, and then professionally speaking, you're, you're teaching high school. Is that going to continue? Or are you going to become a vice principal? What's the next step for a school teacher? Well, the ideal for me is to be able to travel and write and document um, exciting experiences and oral histories from folks around the country and around the world. So I really see myself as a historian and someone who's archiving daily history just from average people to famous people to anyone. I just feel like everyone has special stories that need to be told. So ideally, if I can get paid to do that, Will, that's, the, that's what I really want to do. I feel like I'm kind of transitioning out of teaching over the next year or two. And um, I have more mountains to climb. Oh, okay. But I'm going to be running the whole way. I'm going to be vegan the whole time. And I'm going to be continuing to, to churn out my website and my, my book. Um, Your memoir, which is memoir. coming out in a couple of years, is that? Yes, I do want to find a publisher for that. I had self-published an earlier memoir about teaching called Kamikaze, uh -huh. The Happiness and Horror of Teaching in the Bronx, New York, oh. which is somewhere in the iTunes bookstore, but I don't know Sounds if anyone's like buying it. Sounds like it should be a movie of the week. <laughs> it's it <laughs> has a title been, like that. Not many people have purchased it, but if you do want to look up Kamikaze, it's still out there in the iTunes store, okay. but uh, I, I don't know. I don't think many copies are being sold. But oh, that, that's okay. kind of an early attempt at a memoir. This next attempt, I think, is going to be much stronger. Okay, I okay. know it's going to be much stronger, actually. Well, excellent. <laughs> well, listen, on that note, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you so much, Will.